As authorities struggle to respond to the COVID-19 viral pandemic, everyday life is drastically altered by travel restrictions, school closures, and diminished business and social interactions. It is the most extensive lockdown the world has ever seen. But even as much of our world appears on the verge of completely shutting down, some among us jump into action. From the outset of the outbreak, the scientific community quickly geared up for an urgent battle. Each pathogen has its own path that it takes in that context, and this one has surprised many of us in terms of the speed with which it spread through the Chinese population, and then subsequently the speed with which it has impacted uh, other countries more globally. This is a disease that is completely new, so we don't know really a lot. Every day that goes by, we learn more. At the same time, this is a very fast moving target. And so the more data we have, the better it is. And that knowledge forms the backbone of a critical quest to develop a vaccine to help defeat COVID-19. The Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, or CEPI, supports vaccine research around the world. But the transition from theoretical endeavors to real world needs happened more quickly than anyone anticipated or hoped for. This is the most frightening disease I've ever encountered in my career, and that includes Ebola, it includes MERS, it includes SARS. And it's frightening because of the combination of infectiousness and a lethality that is appears to be many-fold higher than flu. But despite the urgency of the COVID-19 pandemic, epidemiologists and government health officials must face a harsh reality. Vaccine development and testing takes time, at least 12 to 18 months. The vaccine is quite down the road at this point. And now there are a lot of programs are starting worldwide to find those weapons to, to fight the disease. We'd be giving this to normal people to prevent infection. So you must be sure the, 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 the edict of medicine, first do no harm. So we need to make sure it's safe and we make needs to make sure it works. That entire process will take at least a year and a year and a half. Professor Paul Young leads one of the most promising research operations at the moment with his team at Australia's University of Queensland, thanks in part to a CEPI-funded slight head start. For the past six years, they focused their work on broad-based vaccine modeling using mRNA coding, an adaptable methodology able to quickly respond to new viruses as they emerge. So we've developed a, uh, a generic platform technology for vaccine production uh, that could be applicable to a wide range of viruses, and that's why we've been able to apply it uh, to this previously unknown virus relatively rapidly. Amid the initial escalation of the public health emergency in the city of Wuhan, the Chinese released the genetic sequencing of this new coronavirus, COVID-19, on January 10th of 2020. As soon as that was done, we began work on uh, developing our vaccine approach to it. We made more than uh, 200 different versions uh, before we settled on one particular uh, vaccine candidate. And that has already gone into animal studies to prove that we actually induce an immune response that uh, is likely to protect animals. Uh, once we've done that, and we've also gone through toxicity studies, uh, then uh, we'll hopefully be ready to enter clinical trials, human clinical trials, in uh, late June. COVID-19's spike-like structures exhibit a specific protein to gain entry into its host cells in order to replicate. One of the prime immune responses and antibody response that targets that particular protein on the surface of the virus. And that can generate uh, a neutralizing activity or a killing activity that destroys the virus. Young's line of attack aims to unleash the body's defenses by introducing this protein, stabilized or clamped in position, as it would appear on the virus's surface. 
so that when we vaccinate individuals, their immune response sees this protein as though it was the virus itself. And they will mount an immune response uh, that can then become their memory response if they sub subsequently encounter the live virus. So we're trying to mimic the outer exterior of the virus by generating this particular protein as the vaccine immunogen. Disease pandemics litter human history. But vaccination technology is a relatively recent tool in our medical arsenal, one that arose kind of by accident, a response to smallpox in the 18th century, thanks to the discriminating eye of Dr. Edward Jenner and others. People used to say, you know, find a milkmaid. She'll be the most beautiful, beautiful girl in town. Jenner deduced the women's work impacted their appearance. In putting two and two together, the reason they never got smallpox is because by milking their cows, they got blisters on their hands, which were called cowpox. And getting blisters on their hands prevented them, immunized them, we would now say, from getting smallpox. So he created the first vaccine, a thread soaked in a concoction of cowpox material and exposed it to patients by cutting a small slit in their arm. And it wasn't until almost 100 years later that we began to understand that there was such a thing as an infectious disease and that the reason people didn't get most infectious diseases twice is because they were immunized. As scientific understanding grew, so too did the use of vaccines to do battle against some of our most feared diseases, like polio. The parents of 440,000 grammar school children in 44 states gave their permission for injections of the preventive series of three Salk shots. The first three children inoculated were Dr. Salk's own sons, but thousands of others across the country soon joined us for the largest field test in medical history. To this day, smallpox is the only eradicated human disease. But thanks to global vaccination efforts, polio remains only in small pockets. Still dangerous, but held largely at bay. I joined this hospital in 1990. So 20 years back, there were 3,000 new cases of paralytic poliomyelitis in the city of Delhi alone. Today, we have none in Delhi, and in the last year, I think we have had none in the country. Vaccines are very important for producing what we call herd immunity. And herd immunity is, is really the ways in which we can offset the risk of, of large spread of disease by, by immunizing a large portion of the community from it, which means it's much harder for it to spread. And that's helped control many childhood diseases, like measles, mumps, and rubella. And although a lot of people think measles is not so bad, I had it when I was six years old and it seemed pretty bad at the time. But um, nowadays we have a vaccine for it and people don't remember that there, there have been many documented epidemics in which measles killed 30% of the people it infected. You know, after the um, eradication of smallpox and as polio eradication efforts really became more successful, in the mid to late 20th century, there was a feeling that, you know, perhaps the human race had gotten um, infectious diseases licked uh, and they were on the retreat. And perhaps, you know, we could conceive of an era or a time when infectious disease was not necessarily a global health threat. But by the 1970s and 80s, previously unknown diseases emerged, like Ebola and HIV AIDS. So you know, diseases like these were utterly new to science and figuring out ways to respond to what, what we now see as, as new or novel uh, pathogens has become the, the battle of the 21st century. Enter the most recent coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19, a global pandemic which demands a collaborative global response. I think this is the moment to think uh, open data and open science. That would really uh, make a difference. One thing that a major epidemic does is it galvanizes a lot of attention, a lot of funding, and a lot of focus on these diseases themselves. There are multiple vaccine uh, approaches going forward. 
uh, including our own. And we're all of the belief that uh, we're not racing each other. Uh, this is a race against the virus and whoever gets there first in terms of a viable vaccine, we can all cheer for that. Indeed, CEPI supports several research teams engaged in the coronavirus fight, including the NIH vaccine program that went forward with the first human trials on March 16th in Seattle, one of America's first COVID-19 hotspots. It was easy. It was just like a flu shot. I hope that, that we get to a working vaccine quickly and that we can save lives. Still, Australian virologist Paul Young realizes finding a safe vaccine that works is just the start. Perhaps the bigger challenge will be executing on production and deployment. The $64 million question is um, whether uh, we can get this uh, vaccine out into the community uh, in time for it to make a difference. There's absolutely no doubt that deployment of the final vaccine is as big a hurdle as actually generating the vaccine itself. If we're dealing with a viral pathogen that is uh, affecting essentially the global community. Manufacturing that at scale at single sites is probably not going to be viable. Uh, so um, the real uh, issues of uh, the effectiveness of the vaccine become almost secondary to our ability to deliver it to, to a, a broad global population. Young's answer? To essentially proceed on a dual track. Uh, what the global community needs to think about is a completely radical way of uh, approaching this question. If we can uh, ramp up uh, that manufacture at the same time we're determining efficacy, then hopefully we'll be able to deploy a lot earlier than what uh, a traditional pathway of uh, vaccine production would, uh, would mean. Viruses like coronavirus have high mutation rates, which allow them to adjust to different environments and replicate efficiently. Evidence suggests two strains of COVID-19 already exist. But while different strains of influenza can require different vaccines, that's not expected in the fight against COVID-19, at least not yet. Whilst we are seeing mutations accumulate, we don't believe that they're going to have a significant impact on, uh, on vaccines and whether those vaccines are going to be effective. So I don't see this virus moving towards a, uh, a, a more potent, more uh, highly dangerous virus. Um, I think the real challenge with this particular pathogen is its capacity to spread, and it's doing that very efficiently. Of course, it's plenty dangerous at the moment and doesn't appear to be going anywhere anytime soon. Able to survive in the air for up to four hours and remain viable on a variety of everyday surfaces from one to four days, COVID-19's endurance boosts its transmission. It is a lengthy one. This is a virus that's going to be with us for some time. Um, I'm, there, there are many epidemiologists who think that the virus is likely to become globally endemic and be with us in perpetuity. Uh, if I had to bet, I would think that that is the most probable scenario. And that just amps up the urgency for a vaccine to protect communities from COVID-19's most dire consequences. But until any such vaccination can be adequately developed and deployed, the battle against this deadly infection must take place on another front altogether. Vaccines have their place uh, in an outbreak response, uh, but obviously the time it takes to develop them means that uh, uh, standard public health measures right up front are really where we need to place a lot of emphasis at the moment as well. 